name's Rob Langtree. I'm the Global Chief Strategy and Marketing Officer for AWI Woolmark. I think over the period up until about 2010, uh, the wool industry had been pretty much out of touch with the marketing side of its, its activity. Uh, uh, we've lost significantly more share in, um, in women's wear and women's wear is more of a challenge for us because there's still um, that pervasive influence of fast fashion. Um, I think the market for women's wear is more susceptible to shorter and shorter seasons. Um, and from that point of view, you know, we, we like to think that wool is something, I, th I think it was William Westwood who said, who, who said um, buy cheap, choose carefully, make it last, um, and it becomes almost like an asset for you. Yeah. Um, that's at odds with where most of the volume of women's wear is being sold, which is, you know, short, sharp, half a season, you know, yeah. throw it into yeah. landfill. So I, I think we have aspirations and, and some success to rebuild our share in women's wear, but really for us to get what we need back on the farm, um, we're targeting the very high end of that and we're targeting the, the brands that you see in the catwalks in Milan, uh, Paris and London, New York. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about Victoria Beckham. I assume within her clothing range, wool is used, practically yes, the fridge, so to speak. Is that true? Yeah. 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 I mean, if, yeah. You, if you look at wool as a fibre and its percentage share of clothing worldwide, um, there was a time where we would have been 20, 25 more percent of fibre used in apparel. Um, we're currently around 1.2%. So that 1.2%, it, it, it does take a huge effort to grow that. Yeah. Um, you have to grow it in an area where um, it appeals to people who are prepared to spend. And, and yeah. a brand like um, Beckham or um, Gucci or Xenia in menswear, these brands carry the sort of pricing structure that allow them to use the best quality ingredients. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we believe, you know, um, quite correctly so, I think that, that we are the best quality fibre ingredients. Um, but my view would be, you know, and my advice to a young designer would be focus on quality. And the second thing is that's a common piece of advice that a lot of our judging panel give to um, International Mark Prize winners, is focus on your brand and your story. Understand what, what your vision is, identify that story, and don't change the story for anyone. Because oh, that's uniqueness. In the last year, um, I brought new attention to Savile Row. Um, we did some uh, some innovative interviews, and out of that, my story is I'm the first woman in many, many years, apparently, to have a suit made. It, it's about the tradition, but I'm not traditional in any way. Look, I, I think um, <laughs> hearing that background accent of yours, um, <laughs> there'd be a reasonably safe bet to say that you'll spend your time travelling and you'll spend your time in different climates, summers and winters, um, perhaps both within a week of each other. So I think the first thing is whatever you choose as a fabric has to be something that's suitable for either a cooler climate or a warmer climate. Mm -hmm. It can't be a very lightweight cotton because that probably won't do you much good if you're uh, heading sort of up to the, the auctions to have a look at mills. Um, so I, the first thing I would say is go for a light to medium weight. And the second thing is it needs to be 100% merino wool. Um, because it wears better, because it's quite easy to care for, because the cutters do a brilliant job on Savile Row of understanding how to cut cloth made from uh, superfine or ultrafine merino. Um, the third thing is I think the drape is amazing. Um, you know, I don't think you can get even silk or anything else to drape quite the way that a wool suit drapes. And then I guess the, 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 um, the gracie part of it comes on what colour it's going to be. Yes. And maybe what texture it's going to be. Oh. I mean, we may end up with a purple plaid. We don't know, do we? Ooh, no, we don't know. Oh, thank you for that. Mine's just a herringbone or houndstooth that I can sort of vaguely see on you now. It's pretty cool. Yeah, this is, you know, um, <laughs> there are certain women like me that comes at an age where we, we're just looking for different things. And, um, well, I always go through, um, uh, uh, um, how can I put this, elderly women's wardrobes and I'm like I'll have vintage that. vintage vintage well you know so but you know we produce something called the wool lab and, and the wool lab is is a, now a very influential um, trend forecasting tool and all of the fabrics in there are vintage or they're from uh, libraries that wow. date back in some cases a hundred years from Italy from uh, northern England 
And so a lot of the, a lot of the forecasts that we see and a lot of the things that we then relay to the trade um, are all about either using traditional vintage uh, cloths or even reinterpreting some of those weaves and structures and colours and designs into a lighter weight fabric or you know, a, um, perhaps a more stretchy fabric. So it, it's interesting, the, the role of, our, of archives I think is underplayed in, in the industry. It's, it's really, really powerful source of inspiration. When I met you, I was wearing a soldier's jacket from France. So when I walked into um, to the Savile Row um, presentation, I didn't know soldiers were going to be there. So, mm. and I've got this, and I'm definitely going to put this cutaway within this interview. And the soldiers, um, the, the Queen's, one of the Queen's best soldiers, I can't, I think his name is George, came up and he said, where did you get that jacket? So they could identify by the cloth, the style, mm. um, that uh, I think it was World War One or World War Two. I was just gobsmacked. Mm. And, and, and I found that jacket in France, just in a vintage shop. Yeah, you know. Look, I, I, it's interesting. I think, you know, they, they always say everything old is new again. Um, I think from our point of view, um, you're starting to see that there's a very strong influence in Australia this year is the, um, the 100th anniversary of Gallipoli, um, which was a very um, difficult period for Australia, but a very sort of um, embryonic period of our, our history. Um, the World War One uniforms that were worn in that area are becoming quite a sort of local influence here on fashion. Um, and it's where, you know, fashion reflects culture, reflects fashion. And I think a lot of that influence, um, perhaps the more militaristic, the square shoulders, the epaulets, um, those things never go away. They come back in certain sectors at certain times. So, that role of vintage and archive, I think, is very important in, in stimulating and inspiring new design. Um, just quickly, young Australian designers, or what's happening down under regarding regarding designers? Where do we sit right now? Look, Australian design is very fresh. One of the most interesting things to happen with the the burgeoning role of, of e-commerce is that Australians who traditionally would have had to spend a lot of money to get over to Europe or the US or Japan. Um, are now able to actually um, purvey their fashions to a global market online. Right. So their ability to access volume has never been better. The inspiration and the freshness of Australian design is obviously there. Um, we're probably quite colourful. We have a very sort of a summary uh, lifestyle. Um, we tend to have always worn layers because we have such a diverse, um, I guess, uh, climate. Um, so look, I, it's very healthy at the moment. A yeah. lot of success with young designers coming through, um, as there are Australians in Hollywood. Um, I think we export well.